Oh, hello everyone. It's uh, Martin Lashier. A very warm welcome to you all um, for a short webinar on quality risk management best industry practices, at least so far, because obviously uh, companies are always continually improving the, the way they manage risk. Um, very warm welcome. Most of you already know me, but very quick introduction. I'm president of NSF Health Sciences, the pharma biotech division. Um, NSF is a, a unique organization in many respects. It's a not-for-profit organization driven really by one thing, which is to improve the health of people around the world. And that's something my colleagues in devices as well as um, pharmaceutical and biotech um, take very, very seriously, particularly when it comes to um, managing risk. And I guess our key focus is always helping you, our clients, do the basics very, very well. Um, this is the penultimate webinar of the 2015 free webinar program. Um, many of you have attended most of them, if not all of them. I look at this list and think, where the heck is the year gone? Because we're in November, and it only seems yesterday we were talking about how to improve human reliability. But anyway, the subject for our discussion, this, uh, this session is on risk management, best industry practices. The usual essentials, um, this session is being recorded, so it will be available after the session to download and share. And my plea is always the same. Please spread the word. Please share this as widely as you can, because the more people that understand how to manage risk intelligently as well as simply, the better our industry will be. Um, if you require more information, please just contact me on the email address there. Um, I will answer all of your questions. I don't answer questions during the session. Uh, I, I can't multitask, unfortunately, but as many of you know who have sent me questions afterwards, we do arrange calls so that we can do the, uh, give the, the right answer and do the question justice. Um, this really represents a summary of some very extensive, very customized workshops that we provide, as well as consultancy on quality risk management, uh, which are always very, very popular. Um, so, firstly, my sources and my thanks, because uh, what I'm about to present is a summary of best industry practices. They're not necessarily um, based entirely on my opinion, um, but really the opinion of our clients, and we have over a thousand clients worldwide that we often engage with in terms of benchmarking and standard setting. Um, we also work very closely with other external partners, so we have very good links with automobiles, aviation devices, food, and other industries who are also challenged by risk management, and they certainly have some very good practices that we will share as we go through this session. But also, a big thank you to our consultants. Um, um, we're very fortunate in, in having some of the very best, and my particular thanks to these guys with their combined 800 years of industry experience um, globally um, with a mixture of companies um, that have helped to uh, summarize best industry practices. Now, when you ask people, as I do as, uh, in, in my travels regarding quality risk management and how our industry is doing, um, opinions differ um, from those who consider us to be pretty poor, the sort of two to three out of ten. And these are direct quotes from people that we know in industry as well as the regulators. And in, interestingly, what I'm presenting to you is what I presented at the PDA FDA conference um, in Baltimore a few months ago alongside FDA who were actually in full agreement with a lot of what we are going to discuss. And these are direct quotes from, from respected contacts within the industry. You know, quality risk management and our compliance habit, forget it, it simply doesn't go. That's why we're not very good at it. Um, you know, people that believe we've really been left behind, 
that our focus is very much on risk assessment rather than quality risk management, and there is a massive difference there. Um, we work extensively in training QPs. Um, we have a very strong network of QPs across Europe, and there are some of our QPs who believe ICHQ9 was the worst thing that ever happened to QPs. Um, you know, the decisions are questioned. Risk assessment is often used to justify what is bad science or just um, poor, poor judgment. Uh, so there are those in our industry who believe we're not very good at it, but at the other end of the scale, there are people that actually think, you know, we're not too bad. Um, you know, we've been ahead of the game for a long time because we've been applying good manufacturing practices, which arguably is about managing risk, uh, at least preventing problems rather than reacting to them, pro providing we do it correctly. Um, so there are people that think we're good, there are people that think we're not so good, and there are a big, there is a big group in between. So what I'd like to do is to um, share with you best industry practices, but in doing so, acknowledge that there's always going to be differences of opinion. Um, this guy obviously thinks this is worth the risk. Um, now, I'm into mountain biking and I love cycling, um, but I don't think I would take that kind of risk. Um, and the DIY I do, which is quite limited these days, thank goodness, um, would not involve doing that. So whenever you are talking to people about how we manage risk, invariably you get polarized views because people's assessment of interpretation of risk um, is very, very different. Now, I'm going to share with you the top seven best in practice best-in-class practices that really do matter. Um, we started off by having 12. Um, then I thought, well, actually, that's too many. Uh, for those of you that have participated in previous webinars, particularly on human error and risk-based decision-making, you know that the working brain can only remember seven facts plus or minus two, so we try and keep everything to a manageable and memorable top seven. What I'm going to do ladies and gentlemen, is to go through each one of these. These reflect our experience where we have worked with clients, some of the very best, when we have worked with regulators, some of the very best. This, these reflect their opinion with regard to what good quality risk management actually looks like. What I'm going to do is describe each one. There is actually a score sheet, ladies and gentlemen, at the end. Uh, but what I would really encourage you to do is to simply on a piece of paper write down 1 to 7 and give yourself a score 1 to 10 as I describe each one to you. If you do everything I describe, that's a 8, 9, or 10. If you do nothing I describe, that's a 1, 2, or 3. This gives you a reference point when you sit down and talk with your leadership team regarding what needs to be improved, how you stay competitive, and how you keep up with the best. So let's start off with number one. Best in class practices um, start with the leadership. So in companies where we see really good quality risk management, you always find leadership at every level who, as I say, get it. Um, they understand that quality risk management is not a regulate, just a regulatory requirement, but is actually common sense. It's a core competency without which their business will not survive. So they see ICHQ8, ICHQ9, and ICHQ10 as one, um, because actually they were written um, acknowledging the content of each other. So they were written largely as one. I'll describe the bridge later on because it visualizes how quality of risk management applies across the business and is fully integrated rather than being bolted on. The leadership also understand their risk threshold. They're what I call risk savvy. They're risk mature. Um, they're not people who delude themselves with this idea that there is such thing as zero risk. They know there is risk everywhere 
and it's about using that risk and managing intelligently that risk to improve the services as well as their business. Um, leadership also sponsor the education that provides the understanding that then drives the behavior across the organization. And that education starts with ensuring that everybody throughout the organization has really good understanding of products and processes, really good understanding of risk-based decision-making, which we covered earlier in the year, and really good understanding of ICH Q8, Q9, and Q10. So they invest heavily in education, particularly the first one, because without knowledge of products and processes, you simply cannot manage risk because you're not even asking the right questions, let alone concluding the right answers. So leadership plays a, a really important um, role, not just in the words they use, but in the actions they apply. For example, key performance indicators that drive the right behavior, um, measures that ensure culture is transparent and open rather than closed and blamed. Uh, a culture where risk is acknowledged and a culture where improvement results from mistakes. Um, leadership also understands that knowledge needs to be shared across businesses, across departments, between labs, so that knowledge that exists in the self-inspection system is used to drive continuous improvement. Knowledge that exists in the deviation and CAPA system is used to drive improvement. And then when we drive improvement, we manage the risk and reduce the risk accordingly. Leadership also in these organizations ensure that there is really good cross-functional movement of people so that there is integration, so that when risk decisions are being made and quality risk management principles are being applied correctly, they are done so as a result of good knowledge of the people involved because of their knowledge of what happens in other parts of the business. And importantly, the leadership of these companies that do this really, really well really understand the risk of risk aversion. Now, the pharma industry is risk averse. Um, after all, we're making medicines, um, we're making devices to deliver those medicines, and any error or mistake can have catastrophic consequences. So it's not a surprise to, to realize that we're not into taking unnecessary risks. However, when we, come, we become so risk averse, um, when we try and ignore the reality of risk, we actually expose ourselves to considerable danger. Risk aversion um, results in um, maintaining the status quo, in other words, not improving. Um, it often results in increasing bureaucracy, increasing complexity, um, with, with the misunderstanding that more documents, more signatures, more checks actually reduce work and uh, reduce risk. In fact, they do the complete opposite. Um, risk aversion drives people to focus on the system rather than the patient, and ultimately creates a level of inefficiency that is simply unaffordable. We still go to clients, and, um, and very respected clients, who still use the term zero risk in everything they do. Well, it's a myth. It doesn't exist. And more concerning is when people use that ter terminology, which drives then the behavior of risk aversion, it actually results in creating more risk. So the role of leadership is really, really key in understanding risk, its application, and what happens if we do it, very, uh, do it poorly. Um, they understand that in heading due north, which is represented by the Venn diagram, Companies wanting to make this journey um, in their evolution, they have to do the basics very, very well. And we're constantly being knocked off course by huge levels of uncertainty. So we no longer can predict what is going to happen next year, even next month, you would argue, which means that 
our businesses will always be exposed to risk as a result of a level of uncertainty in this very uncertain world we all live that cannot be planned or predicted. So recognizing this, it means that our ability to manage risk is very much a core competency. So best-in-class companies driven by leadership who understand this, who get this, make sure that people understand the context why are we investing so much in quality risk management in the education as well as its application? Why? Because it is key to our survival. These are some of the predictable distractions that are going to hit us um, if they're not hitting you already. You know, we're all going to have to absorb more regulations but with less resource. Um, governments are pushing us to reduce price. There is going to be an increase in criminal activity. Uh, there is going to be an increase in the uh, shortage of skilled workforce. Um, we are going to have a greater complexity of supply chains with all of the risks associated with that. And, you know, if you want to scare yourself, just read the newspapers day in and day out and look at the global events, all of which are saying, look, we can't plan or predict as we used to be. There will be risks that we haven't even thought about. Therefore, our ability to manage risk intelligently is key to our survival because our survival, that true north that we're all heading towards, is what I call the balance. So businesses that will succeed in this volatile, unpredictable world will be businesses that manage to balance these three components, making money, which is profit and efficiency, making sure that we maintain our license to operate and our legacy and our reputation, and obviously making sure that we supply the customers with the right medicines, right price at the right time, within a box of diminishing time and resource. What that means is if any one of these dominates, becomes more stronger and bigger than any of the other components, our businesses are, are, are at risk. And one of the challenges we all face is setting standards that are fit for purpose that ensure that medicines and devices that we manufacture are going to work effectively, safely, and be of the right quality 100% of the time. Setting standards that are affordable as well as achievable is always very challenging. And risk management, quality risk management, allows us to as I say here, hit the sweet spot. In other words, if we do too much in our policies, in our standards, and in the way that we work, if we set standards that are too high, complexity increases, bureaucracy increases, costs go up. If we do too little, we are also at risk um, for very obvious reasons. So quality risk management gives us a mechanism and a way of thinking to ensure that what we do on a day-to-day -day basis hits the sweet spot. In other words, we are able to balance those three components of our business, efficiency and profit, license to operate, and customer satisfaction, because if we don't achieve that, business, that, that balance, that important balance, our businesses are at risk. Um, these leaders, and we're still on number one because it is so key and so fundamental to the way that quality risk management is applied throughout the organization. These leaders recognize, and we've talked about this on previous webinars, that our success is down to just doing the basics to PhD level. And many of these we've already covered on previous webinars, risk-based decision-making, making sure that we have excellent understanding of our products and processes, making sure that we educate rather than train, and making sure that we apply best-in-class practices for quality risk management. So if we do the basics exceptionally well, and quality risk management is one, but just one, we will succeed. If we don't, we're going to be challenged. I mentioned earlier, ladies and gentlemen, the bridge. Uh, we use this in NSF to describe and to visualize a quality management system. Now, without getting into too much detail, the purpose of a quality management system, well, there is just one, and that is to improve your competitive edge. That's it. 
by that we mean balancing those three components staying in compliance sure but we've got to make money to stay in business and we've got to make damn sure that the customers are satisfied with what they are getting so the purpose of the quality system is to move products from research and development all the way through to the patient along the bridge or across the bridge as quickly safely and efficiently as possible but as you see the bridge is only as good as the people holding it up the regulatory tide is always um, getting higher um, and you can see each individual element of the bridge represented each individual individual element of the quality system represented but importantly risk management oversees everything so quality risk management applies across our business it's not bolted on it's not a single component it applies to how we manage change it applies to how we design and execute our audit and self-inspection system we use quality risk management to decide on the level of detail in SOPs what suppliers we need to audit more frequently um, than others so quality risk management applies across the quality system or as we describe it across the bridge a um, couple of you have asked questions here is it possible to have uh, to, to, to have the support from leadership again any questions coming through ladies and gentlemen and I'll reach out to you later so that we can really do each question justice so number one best-in-class practice is having leadership at every level who get it and interestingly we've educated at every level in a lot of companies from the VP level down to the shop floor where decisions are routinely made so that people understand what good quality risk management is how to apply it and so on let's move on to so give yourself a score ladies and gentlemen for that you know where you believe your leadership sits do they get it or do they not let's move on to number two um, best-in-class companies really excel at understanding their processes and products we mentioned this earlier they understand the critical control points they understand the key quality attributes they make use of what I call tribal knowledge through their organization so that knowledge that sits between people's ears of the most experienced people is downloaded um, and accessible so they invest a huge amount of time and effort in making sure that people understand their products and processes um, this is quite a busy slide and it's slightly unfortunate ladies and gentlemen when we show this on courses it comes up one um, pain at a time so apologies for the complexity of this if we start off at the, uh, the the top of the slide in terms of how quality risk management can be applied in terms of our manufacturing processes um, for each step of our manufacturing processes we understand or we should understand the critical control points that have a direct impact upon the key attributes of the product we design our control strategy to ensure those CCPs remain in control risk registers and you know, this is always an interesting subject when we go to clients and we talk about risk registers and they're sort of dismissed by many as well this is just something regulators our own MHRA in particular require therefore we do it to satisfy the regulators which is unfortunate because it's wrong because risk registers are a very very useful way of making information accessible and available so that leadership can literally at the touch of a button understand where the risks are in their business understand who is owning that and understanding also what measures are being taken to manage control and reduce and a good risk register actually provides access to that information but that allows us to set alarms appropriately it allows us to get the SOPs right it allows us to ensure that content in batch manufacturing records are fit for purpose based on risk it allows us to get our calibration
frequencies and parameters just right. In the absence of a risk register or similar file, if you like, uh, repository for this information, unfortunately, when you don't have a single point of contact, that information gets disseminated and ultimately lost through the organization. So ultimately, when it comes to how we manage our annual product reviews, our deviations, our changes, all driven by risk, all driven by understanding of our products and processes, with the risks associated accessible, whether you use a risk register or anything that performs the same function. So number two is about accessibility, is about knowledge of products and processes, number one, but it's also making sure that that knowledge is available so that it can be accessed when risk-based decisions are being made. Because as we covered in our module on our webinar on risk-based decision making, so much depends on having accurate and reliable data so that you can make data-driven decisions rather than decisions being made based upon assumption and as well as um, emotion. So give yourself a mark out of 10, ladies and gentlemen, for number two. To what extent do you have that level of knowledge and expertise across the organization in relation to your products and processes, understanding of critical control points, understanding of control strategy, understanding of those parts of the process that if they go wrong would have a direct impact on product quality? And also is that accessible for all so that it helps in the process of making risk-based decisions. Let's move on to number three. Best-in-class companies apply most of their focus on preventing errors, preventing risk, rather than in reaction to it. So best-in-class companies use quality risk management in designing their self-inspection program, what areas to spend longer on, what areas to focus on. We don't have resource to do everything. We need to be intelligent in the way that we use that very limited resource. And it means that we can apply quality risk management to decide where we audit, how, free, how, how often. Similarly, in supplier management, where, are, where is our greatest risk? How much attention should we pay to particular suppliers over others? How often should we maintain equipment? How can we move from planned maintenance to reliability-centered maintenance? Well, the answer is by using quality risk management. How do we simplify batch manufacturing records? By removing data, by removing signatures, so that people stand a chance of following the BMR. The answer is by using quality risk management. You know, we run a lot of workshops with clients to simplify batch manufacturing records. And the theme that holds it all together, the thread that runs throughout, is quality risk management. So give yourself a mark out of 10, ladies and gentlemen, for, <coughs> excuse me, for how you use quality risk management. Do you use it more to prevent and reduce risk, in which case give yourself a good score, but if quality risk management to you actually means risk assessment using FMEA, usually after the event, give yourself a very low score for that reactionary focus. I always find it quite fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you'll all agree with me on this one. It's far better to spend $100, 100 euros, 100 pounds, preventing rather than a hundred thousand pound reacting that is after the events whether it be firefighting crisis management fixing 483s fixing warning letters you know we spend a lot of time helping clients do that and boy when you look at the bill afterwards it's pretty evident that if they'd spent a hundred dollars preventing they would have been a whole lot better off but uh Maybe that's just human nature. Just some examples of proactive risk 
assess uh, risk management and how it has been used. And I, I give you these examples to give you hope and to give you ammunition um, to use if you're struggling to convince senior leadership of the value of working to prevent rather than in reaction to. One of our clients, we helped simplify their documentation. And simplifying means taking away. When you take things away, people get really, really nervous because of the risk associated with taking detail away. In fact, taking whole SOPs away. Um, well, this company did that. We ran a workshop with them, four days. And using quality risk management, we managed to reduce their SOPs by 28%. Um, procedural errors reduced by 37%. Same clients, we did a very similar exercise, again, using quality risk management to make objective risk-based decisions so that we could comfortably, without losing any sleep, remove from 400 pages to 110. The right first time for the BMRs went from 76%. In fact, they are now 100%, not 92%. And the cycle time drastically shortened from five days through down to one hour. So there's some real return on investment here when you start using quality risk management as, it, as ICHQ9 intended, which was proactively to improve our comp uh, competitive edge and reduce work uh, uh, risk. So give yourself a mark out of 10, ladies and gentlemen, for how well you use, as we said earlier, quality risk management, is it to prevent or is it in reaction to? If you genuinely use it, and I gave some examples there, in that way, give yourself a good score. But if it's just reactionary, give yourself a low score. Um, number four, in all of these organizations where quality risk management is applied very, very well, it is embedded throughout their organization. If you go back to that bridge I showed earlier, quality risk management was the sort of cloud over it all. It actually impacted on each area of the business. So whether it be in documentation, whether it be in dossier content. For example, one of our clients, we, we, we did a, a risk management course not for their QA folk uh, or their manufacturing people. We actually did it for their people um, responsible for submitting their marketing authorizations, submitting their manufacturing authorizations, submitting their biological license applications. Because the more detail you put in, the greater the complexity and the harder management of change becomes as a result of content that you put into the dossier that regulators now expect you to comply with fully. So we spent a lot of time with the regulatory department to actually use risk management to decide what goes in and what can stay out. So in each of these areas, environmental monitoring is an example, where good application of quality risk management can really focus your monitoring program because vol doing more is often not as good as doing less. So it's about thinking about where to sample and how to sample and making the right decisions based upon risk. So my question to you is how do you compare with this best in class practice? Is quality risk management truly embedded, not in a reactionary sense when things go wrong with documentation or maintenance or with audits, but in a preventive sense to improve efficiency, reduce complexity, and so on. So give yourself a mark out of 10 for number four. Just a, another example, and I've tried to give as many examples as possible, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a company who got significant return on their investments. Um, we work with them on their deviation in CAPA system. Um, and what they demonstrated was that after our session, quality incident reporting increased because you want people to report incidents. They started to do their investigations within 30 minutes because the faster you do an incident investigation, the better the investigation. Previously, it was a 
two weeks duration. But importantly, they triaged. They risked ranked all of their deviations, all of their errors within four hours. Previously, this was never done. So they were compromised by treating every incident the same. We all know that every incident is not the same. You can have very minor incidents with virtually no risk and very serious incidents with a lot of risk. And you need to be able to differentiate in order to protect your business by focusing on high risk incidents. So we designed with them a risk-based impact assessment form in, to enable them to objectively, using data um, and the facts, decide with high, medium, and low. Repeat incidents as a result of this far better, far more efficient, faster, risk-based approach were reduced by 74%. Similarly, another example of a change control system. Um, previously, this particular company approved everything, um, and any change control system that approves everything is a very dangerous change control system because one of the jobs of a change control system is to stop change that adds no value. Um, and it's not uncommon that we find at least companies don't stop change. The change control system approves everything. And the way you decide, do I approve, accept the change, or reject it, is by using an impact assessment form, a risk-based impact assessment form. And this particular company achieved return on investment by seeing 40% of requests rejected. That allowed more time, more resource, more energy to be directed to the changes that really did matter. Uh, the approval time went from weeks to minutes. And the success rate for changes implemented went from less than 10%. Just imagine the amount of time and resource wasted when so many changes, 90% of changes, were unsuccessful to 76% all achieved through using quality risk management impact assessment forms based upon six, uh, based upon risk. Moving on, so give yourself a mark out of 10 for number four. Moving on to number five. Um, in all of these organizations that do this really well, they do it because it's simple. Um, you know, clients I go to when I ask, you know, can I, can I please see your quality risk management policy, how you do impact assessments, how you apply this across your business? You know, my heart sinks as the, 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 the document, all sort of 70, 80, 90 pages of quality risk management policy sort of hits the desk and, and, and reverberates around the room. Because that level of complexity means that nobody's going to read it. Nobody will apply it. Nobody will make reference to it. And the whole purpose of a policy that sets the standards, uh, what is to be expected, a, you know, SOPs that describe the how, they must be kept simple. Policy two to three pages, simple process flow, which is usually ICHQ9, examples of impact assessments, structured, standardized, so that everybody across the organization is using it, and it is enforced and disciplined as such. So when you have a simple quality risk management policy, when you have simple QRM SOPs, when you have simple um, impact assessment forms, you then have something people will use. You know, a few months ago, we talked about simplification. So please, if you didn't listen to that webinar, go and listen to it because we analyzed this in particular so that you can actually start simplifying because that is another core competency. Just another example here, ladies and gentlemen, um, just to sort of give you hope as to what could be achieved. Um, one of our clients with a deviation investigation systems, they, they dramatically improved what they did by education and that was another session that we ran on the 10 2070 approach to education. Uh, their products and their processes, um, 
application of ICHQ9 and Q10, better risk-based decision-making, and a session on human error, which all of these collectively dramatically improved business performance. And the theme that runs throughout is quality risk management. Um, so, number six, in all of these companies, just moving on, that do this exceptionally well, there is always a multidisciplinary approach to quality risk management. The last thing you want is QA doing risk assessments and, and um, coming to a conclusion in isolation. The last thing you want is manufacturing doing that in isolation. The last thing you want is engineering making risk assessments in isolation because when you do things in isolation, you only get one person's particular view uh, of the world and of risk management. And best-in-class companies ensure that when risk-based decisions are made based upon good principles of quality risk management, it is done in a very collaborative way which engages and makes use of the subject matter experts in each of these uh, and probably more parts of the business. Now, it doesn't mean to say that on every occasion you have to involve and engage all of these. I think we all know that would be unmanageable. But when you're making decisions based upon risk, uh, either proactively or reactively, it's knowing who to go to in organizations to get another view, to get another um, to, to get more knowledge based upon their areas of expertise. So, you know, if engineers were looking at remove, moving from planned maintenance to reliability-centered maintenance, sure, you do need all of their engineering input to decide which pieces of equipment um, can go from planned maintenance of every five weeks or every five months to reliability-centered maintenance of every eight months. So their engineering input is key, but also input from development, also input from QA, also input from manufacturing would be equally vital in coming to a balanced decision that balances those three components of that Venn diagram we talked about earlier. So part of and this was an interesting example of a company, a client we worked with who did this exceptionally well. They had a quality review panel, so really key decisions, uh, and this fed into their quality risk register. Um, key decisions were made by a panel of four representatives from engineering, manufacturing, QA, and development, and they had a very, very good process to resolve disagreements. Whenever you do risk assessments, whenever you are balancing cost to benefit and risks, one thing is for sure and one thing is actually essential and that is disagreements. You will always have people that consider one risk to be high, one risk, uh, other people that would consider the same risk to be medium, and other people who would consider the same risk to be low. And in decision making, good decision making, as we've examined in the past, is about exploring those areas of disagreement rather than arguing and defending our position. So this particular client had an arbitration panel. So where there were disagreements, instead of you know, people looking for a compromise or instead of QA saying, you know what, I'm not going to release the batch unless we consider this high risk, they introduced an arbitration panel where these disagreements, just seeing the world in a, in a completely different way, were independently assessed, focused on the patient's safety, quality, efficacy, all with the intention of keeping that pendulum we mentioned earlier in the sweet pot, in the sweet spot. So this was a mechanism of ensuring that decisions were calibrated so that risk aversion didn't sweep in because we all know that creates high risk, but also making sure that 
they weren't taking unintentionally taking risk gambling because they'd never suffered before. So this is a really neat way of making sure you stay in the sweet spot. So moving on to the last best in class practice, ladies and gentlemen, um, companies that really do this well never accept they're doing it as well as they can. So in all of these companies that we work with who do it exceptionally well, every year they consult with all stakeholders and they look at the risk register, they look at all of their performance data, and they say to themselves, what have we done well? What do we need to do better? What is stopped doing? What errors have we made? How can we improve? Um, because everybody views risk differently, and this is a core competency, one of which, one of the many core competencies that we need to excel at in order to survive and prosper in this very, very volatile world. Because, you know, Everybody does view risk differently. Um, you know, what is acceptable to some people um, is not acceptable to others. And quality risk management, you know, personally I think this is a pretty high risk, but I guess after a few beers it's less so. The point I'm making is that when you apply quality risk management very well, if you're scoring 8, 9, and 10 in all of these areas, you know that you are doing it well improving your, your competitive edge, protecting your patients, and reducing risk. If you're down at the one, two, and three, you've got to improve because without it, you will struggle. Finish off, ladies and gentlemen, 2016, I can't believe Christmas is just around the corner, um, is approaching fast. So we've only got one more webinar of the 2015 program to go. In January, we will be publishing um, our 2016 webinars, providing you want them. You know, these are designed to be a service. They're designed to provide you, the industry, with information that can improve your businesses, improve the quality of the medicines that, that we all supply uh, to, to a growing market. So my question really is, do you want to continue with these free webinars? If you could please give me feedback, um, because you know if I don't get any feedback, then we'll consider maybe stopping them. But if I do get feedback that you know you're saying these are actually quite useful, Martin, um, and keep doing them, that'd be great, and we will. My question also is, what subjects would you like that will appeal to a general audience, will prepare you for the future? and will make, at least help to make your life a lot easier. You know, that's the motivation that drives these webinars, is us, MSF, trying to make your very complex uh, lives a whole lot easier. So your feedback would be really appreciated. If you want more webinars, please let us know. Please guide us into the subjects that you feel would be really valuable, and we'll continue. Um, so on that note, ladies and gentlemen, um, Lots of you have sent me through questions, um, and what I'll be asking my secretary to do is to arrange a call later with you, and then I can do your very good questions justice. If you have any more questions, any more thoughts, you require any more follow-up, uh, please just contact me on my email address, and I will respond. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, and uh, see you in December when we talk about microbial contamination and its control. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.